This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Read by Mark Nelson. The Gifts of Asti by Andre Norton. Even here, on the black terrace before the forgotten mountain retreat of Asti, it was possible to smell the dank stench of burning memphir, to imagine that the dawn wind bore upward from the pillaged city the faint tortured cries of those whom the barbarians of Clem hunted to their prolonged death. Indeed, it was time to leave. Farta, last of the virgin maidens of Asti, shivered. The scaled and wattled creature who crouched beside her thigh turned his reptilian head so that golden eyes met the aquamarine ones set slantingly at a faintly provocative angle in her smooth ivory face. We go? She nodded in answer to that unvoiced question Lur had sent into her brain, and turned toward the dark cavern which was the mouth of Asti's last dwelling place. Once, more than a thousand years before, when the walls of Memphir were young, Asti had lived among men below. But in the richness and softness which was trading Memphir, empire of empires, Asti found no place. So he, and those who served him, had withdrawn to this mountain outcrop. And she, Varta, was the last, the very last, to bow knee at Asti's shrine and raise her voice in the dawn hymn. For Lur, as were all his race, was mute. Even the loot of Memphir would not sate the shaggy-headed warriors who had stormed her gates this day. The stairway to Asti's temple was plain enough to see, and there would be those to essay the steep climb, hoping to find a treasure which did not exist. For Asti was an austere god, delighting in plain walls and bare altars. His last priest had lain in the grave niches these three years, and there would be no one to hold that gate against intruders. Varta passed between tall, uncarved pillars, Lur padding beside her, his spine mane erect, the talons on his forefeet clicking on the stone in steady rhythm. So they came to the innermost shrine of Asti, and there Varta made graceful obeisance to the great cowled and robed figure which sat enthroned, its hidden eyes focused upon its own outstretched hand. And above the flattened palm of that wide hand hung suspended in space the round orange-red sunball which was twin to the sun that lighted herb. Around the miniature sun swung in their orbits the four worlds of the system, each obeying the laws of space even as did the planets they represented. Memphir has fallen. Varta's voice sounded rusty in her own ears. She had spoken so seldom during the last lonely months. Evil has risen to overwhelm our world, even as it was prophesied in your revelations, O ruler of worlds and maker of destiny. Therefore, obeying the order given of old, I would depart from this, thy house. Suffer me now to fulfill the law. Three times she prostrated her slim body on the stones at the foot of Asti's judgment chair. Then she arose, and with the confidence of a child in its father, she laid her hand palm upward upon the outstretched hand of Asti. Beneath her flesh the stone was not cold and hard, but seemed to have an inner heat, even as might be a human hand. For a long moment she stood so, and then she raised her hand slowly, carefully, as if within its slight hollow she cupped something precious. And as she drew her hand away from the grasp of Asti, the tiny sun and its planets followed, spinning now above her palm as they had above the statues but out of the cowled figure some virtue had departed with the going of the miniature solar system. It was now but a carving of stone. And Varta did not look at it again as she passed behind its bulk to seek a certain place in the temple wall, known to her from much reading of the old records. 
Having found the stone she sought, she moved her hand in a certain pattern before it, so that the faint radiant streaming from the tiny sun gleamed on the grayness of the wall. There was a grating, as from metal long unused, and a block fell back, opening a narrow door to them. Before she stepped within, the priestess lifted her hand above her head, and when she withdrew it, the sun and planets remained to form a diadem just above the intricate braiding of her dull red hair. As she moved into the secret way, the five orbs swung with her, and in the darkness there the sun glowed richly, sending out a light to guide their feet. They were at the top of a stairway, and the hollow clang of the stone as it moved back into place behind them echoed through a gulf which seemed endless. But that, too, was as the chronicles had said, and Varta knew no fear. How long they journeyed down into the maw of the mountain, and beyond that into the womb of Herb itself, Varta never knew. But when feet were weary and she knew the bite of real hunger, they came into a passageway which ended in a room hollowed of solid rock. And there, preserved in the chest in which men born in the youth of Memphir had laid them, Varta found that which would keep her safe on the path she must take. She put aside the fine silks, the jeweled cincture which had been the badge of Asti's service, and drew on over her naked body a suit of scaled skin, gemmed and glistening in the rays of the small sun. There was a hood to cover the entire head, taloned gloves for the hands, webbed, clawed coverings for the feet, as if the skin of a giant, man-like lizard had been tanned and fashioned into this suit. And Varta suspected that that might be so. The world of Herb had not always been held by the human kind alone. There were supplies here, too, lying untouched in ageless containers within a lizard-skin pouch. Varta touched her tongue without fear to a powdered restorative, sharing it with Lur, whose own mailed skin would protect him through the dangers to come. She folded the regalia she had stripped off and laid it in the chest, smoothing it regretfully before she dropped the lid upon its shimmering color. Never again would Asti's servant wear the soft stuff of his livery. But she was resolute enough when she picked up the food pouch and strode forward, passing out of the robing chamber, into a narrow way which was a natural fault in the rock, unsmoothed by the tools of man. But when this rocky road ended upon the lip of a gorge, Varta hesitated, plucking at the throat-latch of her hood-like helmet. Through the unclouded crystal of its eye-holes she could see the sprouts of yellow vapour, which puffed from crannies in the rock-wall down which she must climb. If the records of the temple spoke true, these curls of gas were death to all lunged creatures of the upper world. She could only trust that the cunning of the scaled hood would not fail her. The long talons fitted to the fingertips of the gloves the claws of the webbed foot-coverings clamped fast to every hand and foothold. But the way down was long, and she caught a message of weariness from Lur before they reached the piled rocks at the foot of the cliff. The puffs of steamy gas had become a fog through which they groped their way slowly, following a trace of path along the base of the cliff. Time did not exist in the underworld of Herb. Varta did not know whether it was still today or whether she had passed into tomorrow when they came to a crossroads. She felt Lur press against her, forcing her back against a rock. There is a thing coming. His message was clear. And in a moment she too saw a dark hulk nosing through the vapor. It moved slowly, seeming to balance at each step, as if travel was a painful act. But it bore steadily to the meeting of the two paths. It is no enemy. But she did not need that reassurance from Lur. Unearthly as the thing looked, it had no menace. 
With a last twist of its ungainly body, the creature squatted on a rock and clawed the clumsy covering it wore about its bone-thin shoulders and domed skull head. The visage it revealed was long and gray, with dark pits for eyes and a gaping, fang-studded, lipless mouth. "'Who are you to dare to tread the forgotten ways and rouse from slumber the guardian of the chasms?' The question was a shrill whine in her brain. Her hands half arose to cover her ears. "'I am Varta, maiden of Asti. Memphir has fallen to the barbarians of the outer lands, and now I go as Asti once ordered.' The guardian considered her answer gravely. In one skeleton claw it fumbled a rod and with this it now traced certain symbols in the dust before Varta's webbed feet. When it had done, the girl stooped, and altered two of the lines with a swift stroke from one of her talons. The creature of the chasm nodded its misshapen head. "'Hast he does not rule here. But long and long and long ago there was a pact made with us in his name.' Pass free from us, woman of the light. There are two paths before you. The guardian paused for so long that Varta dared to prompt it. Where do they lead, guardian of the dark? This will take you down into my country. It jerked the rod to the right. And that way is death for creatures from the surface world. The other, in our old legends it is said, to bring a traveller out into the upper world. Of the truth of that I have no proof. But that one I must take. She made a slight obeisance to the huddle of bones and dank cloak on the rock, and it inclined its head in grave courtesy. With Lur pushing a little ahead, she took the robe which ran straight into the flume-veiled darkness nor did she turn to look again at the thing from the chasm world. They began to climb again, across slimed rock, where there were evil trails of other things which lived in this haunted darkness. But the son of Asti lighted their way, and perhaps some virtue in the rays from it kept away the makers of such trails. When they pulled themselves up onto a wide ledge, the talons on Varda's gloves were worn to splintered stubs, and there was a bright girdle of pain about her aching body. Lur lay panting beside her, his red forked tongue protruding from his foam-ringed mouth. "'We walk again the ways of men.' Lur was the first to note the tool-marks on the stone where they lay. "'By the will of Asti we may win out of this maze after all.' Since there were no signs of the deadly steam, Varta dared to push off her hood and share with her companion the sustaining powder she carried in her pouch. There was a freshness to the air they breathed, damp and cold though it was, which hinted of the upper world. The ledge sloped upwards, at a steep angle at first, and then more gently. Lur slipped past her and thrust head and shoulders through a break in the rock. Grasping his neck-spines, she allowed him to pull her through that narrow slit into the soft blackness of a surface night. They tumbled down together, Varta's head pillowed on Lur's smooth side, and so slept as the sun and worlds of Asti whirled protectingly above them. A whir of wings in the air above her head awakened Varta. One of the small, jewel-bright flying lizard creatures of the deep jungle poised and dipped to investigate more closely the worlds of Asti. But at Varta's upflung arm it uttered a rasping cry and planed down into the mass of vegetation below. By the glint of sunlight on the stone around them the day was already well advanced. Varta tugged at Lur's mane until he roused. There was a regularity to the rocks piled about their sleeping-place which hinted that they had lain among ruins left by man. But of this side of the mountain both were ignorant, for Memphir's rule had not run here. 
many dead things in times past. Lur's scarlet nostril pits were extended to their widest. But that was long ago. This land is no longer held by men. Varta laughed cheerfully. If here there are no men, then there will rise no barbarian hordes to dispute our rule. Asti has led us to safety. Let us see more of the land he gives us. There was a road leading down from the ruins, a road still to be followed, in spite of the lash of landslip and the crack of time. And it brought them into a cup of green fertility, where the lavishness of Asti's sowing was unchecked by man. Varta seized eagerly upon globes of blood-red fruit, which she recognized as delicacies which had been cultivated in the temple gardens, while Lur went hunting into the fringes of the jungle, where dining on prey so easily caught as to be judged devoid of fear. The jungle-choked highway curved, and they were suddenly fronted by a desert of sear desolation, a desert floored by glassy slag, which sent back the sunbeams in a furnace glare. Varta shaded her eyes and tried to see the end of this, but if there was a distant rim of green beyond, the heat distortions in the air concealed it. Lur put out a front paw to test the slag, but withdrew it instantly. "'It cooks the flesh. We cannot walk here,' was his verdict. Varta pointed with her chin to the left, where, some distance away, the mountain wall paralleled their course. Then let us keep to the jungle over there and see if it does not bring around to the far side. But what made this? She leaned out over the glassy stuff, not daring to touch the slick surface. War. Lur's tongue shot out to impale a questing beetle. These forgotten people fought with fearsome weapons. But what weapon could do this? Memphir knew not such. Memphir was old, but mayhap there were those who raised city on herb before the first hut of Memphir squatted on tidal mud. Men forget knowledge in time. Even in Memphir the lords of the last days forgot the wisdom of their earlier sages. They fell before the barbarians easily enough. If ever men had wisdom to produce this, it was not of Asti's giving. She edged away from the glare. Let us go. But now they had to fight their way through jungle, and it was hard, until they reached a ridge of rock running out from the mountain as a tongue thrust into the blasted valley, and along this they picked their slow way. There is water near. Lur's thought answered the girl's desire. She licked dry lips longingly. This way. Her companion's sudden turn was to the left, and Varta was quick to follow him down a slide of rock. Lur's instinct was right, as it ever was. There was water before them, a small lake of it. But even as he dipped his fanged muzzle toward the inviting surface, Lur's spined head jerked erect again. Varta snatched back the hand she had put out, staring at Lur's strange actions. His nostrils expanded to their widest, his long neck outstretched. He was swinging his head back and forth across the limpid shallows. "'What is it?' "'This is no water such as we know,' the scaled one answered flatly. "'It has life within it.' Varta laughed. "'Fish, water, snakes, your own distant kin, Lur. It is the scent of them which you catch. No, it is the water itself which lives, and yet does not live. His thought trailed away from her as he struggled with some problem. No human brain could follow his unless he willed it so. Varda squatted back on her heels and began to look at the water, and then at the banks with more care. For the first time she noted the odd patches of brilliant color which floated just below the surface of the liquid. Blue, green, yellow, crimson, they drifted slowly with the tiny waves which lapped the shore. But they were not alive, 
she was almost sure of that, they appeared more a part of the water itself. Watching the voyage of one patch of green, she caught sight of the branch. It was a drooping shoot of the turby, the same tree-vine which produced the fruit she had relished less than an hour before. Above the water dangled a cluster of the fruit, dead ripe, with the sweet pulp stretching its skin. But below the surface of the water... Barta's breath hissed between her teeth, and Lur's head snapped around as he caught her thought. The branch below the water bore a perfect circle of green flowers close to its tip, the flowers which the turby had borne naturally seven months before, and which should long ago have turned into just such sweetness as hung above. With Lur at her heels, the girl edged around to pull cautiously at the branch. It yielded at once to her touch, swinging its tip out of the lake. She sniffed. There was a languid perfume in the air, the perfume of the blooming turby. She examined the flowers closely. To all appearances, they were perfect and natural. It preserves. Lur settled back on his haunches and waved one front paw at the quiet water. What goes into it remains as it was just at the moment of entrance. But if this is seven months old... It may be seven years old, corrected Lur. How can you tell when the branch first dipped into the lake? Yet the flowers do not fade, even when withdrawn from the water. This is indeed a mystery. Of which I would know more. Varta dropped the turby and started on around the edge of the lake. Twice more they found similar evidence of preservation in flower or leaf, wherever it was covered by the opaline water. The lake itself was a long and narrow slash, with one end cutting into the desert of glass, while the other wet the foot of the mountain. And it was there, on the slope of the mountain where they found the greatest wonder of all, Lur scenting it before they sighted the remains among the stones. "'Man-made,' he cautioned, "'but very, very old.' and truly the wreckage they came upon must have been old, perhaps even older than Memphir. For the part which rested above the water was almost gone, rusty red stains on the rocks outlining where it had lain. But underwater was a smooth silver hull, shining and untouched by the ears. Varta laid her hand upon a ruddy scrap between two rocks, and it became a drift of powdery dust. And yet, there, a few feet below, was strong metal. Lur padded along the scrap of shore, surveying the thing. It was a machine in which men traveled, his thoughts arose to her. But they were not as the men of Memphir, perhaps not even as the sons of Herb. Not as the sons of Herb? Her astonishment broke into open speech. Lur's neck twisted as he looked up at her. Did the men of Herb, even in the old chronicles, fight with weapons such as would make a desert of glass? There are other worlds than Herb. Mayhap this strange thing was a skyship from such a world. All things are possible by the will of Asti. Varta nodded. All things are possible by the will of Asti, she repeated. But Lur... Her eyes were round with wonder. Perhaps it is Asti's will which brought us here to find this marvel. Perhaps he has some use for us and it. At least we may discover what lies within it. Lur had his own share of curiosity. How? The two of us cannot draw that out of the water. No, but we can enter into it. Varta fingered the folds of the hood on her shoulders. She knew what Lur meant. The suit which had protected her in the underworld was impervious to everything outside its surface, or to every substance its makers knew, just as Lur's own hide made his flesh impenetrable. But the fashioners of her suit had probably never known of the living lake, and what if she had no defense against the strange properties of the water? 
She leaned back against a rock. Overhead the worlds and son of Asti still traveled their appointed paths. The worlds of Asti! If it was his will which had brought them here, then Asti's power would wrap her round with safety. By his will she had come out of Memphir over ways no human of herb had ever trod before. Could she doubt that his protection was with her now? It took only a moment to make secure the webbed shoes, to pull on and fasten the hood, to tighten the buckles of her gloves. Then she crept forward, shuddering as the water rose about her ankles. But Lur pushed on before her, his head disappearing fearlessly under the surface as he crawled through the jagged opening in the ship below. Smashed engines, which had no meaning in her eyes, occupied most of the broken section of the wreck. None of the metal showed any deterioration beyond that which had occurred at the time of the crash. Under her exploring hands it was firm and whole. Lure was pulling at a small door, half hidden by a mass of twisted wires and plates, and, just as Varta crawled around this obstacle to join him, the barrier gave way, allowing them to squeeze through into what had once been the living quarters of the ship. Varta recognized seats, a table, and other bits of strictly utilitarian furniture. But of those who had once been at home here there remained no trace. Lur, having given one glance to the furnishings, was prowling about the far end of the cabin uncertainly, and now he voiced his uneasiness. There is something beyond, something which once had life. Varta crowded up to him. To her eyes the wall seemed without line of an opening, and yet Lur was running his broad front paws over it carefully, now and then throwing his weight against the smooth surface. There is no door, she pointed out doubtfully. No door, ah, here. Lur unsheathed formidable fighting claws to their full length for perhaps the first time in his temple-sheltered life, and endeavored to work them into a small crevice. The muscles of his forelegs and quarters stood out in sharp relief under his scales. His fangs were bare as his lips snapped back with effort. Something gave. A thin black line appeared to mark the edges of a door. Then time or Lur's strength, broke the ancient locking mechanism. The door gave so suddenly that they were both sent hurtling backward, and Lur's breath burst from him in a huge bubble. The sealed compartment was hardly more than a cupboard, but it was full. Spread-eagled against the wall was a four-limbed creature whose form was so smothered in a bulky suit that Varda could only guess that it was akin in shape to her own. Hoops of metal locked it firmly to the wall, but the head had fallen forward so that the face played in the helmet was hidden. Slowly the girl breasted the water which filled the cabin, and reached her hands toward the bowed helmet of the prisoner. Gingerly, her blunted talons scraping across metal, she pulled it up to her eye level. The eyes of that which stood within the suit were closed, as if in sleep, but there was a warm, healthy tint to the bronze skin, so different in shade to her own pallid coloring. For the rest, the prisoner had the two eyes, the centered nose, the properly shaped mouth which were common to the men of Herb. Hair grew on his head, black and thick, and there was a faint shadow of beard on his jawline. "'This is a man,' her thought reached Lur. Why not? Did you expect a serpent? It is a pity he is dead. Varta felt a rich, warm tide rising in her throat to answer that teasing half-question. There were times when Lur's thought-reading was annoying. He had risen to his hind legs so that he too could look into the shell which held their find. Yes, a pity, he repeated. But... A vision of the turby flowers swept through her mind. Had Lur suggested it, or had that wild thought been hers alone? 
only this ship was so old, so very old. Lur's red tongue flicked. It can do no harm to try, he suggested slyly, and set his claws into the hoop holding the captive's right wrist, testing its strength. But the metal on the shore, it crumpled into powder at my touch, she protested. What if we carry him out only to have... to have... Her mind shuddered away from the picture that followed. Did the turby blossom fade when pulled out? countered Lur. There is a secret to these fastenings. He pulled and pried impatiently. Varta tried to help, but even their united strength was useless against the force which held the loops in place. Breathless, the girl slumped back against the wall of the cabin, while Lur settled down on his haunches. One of the odd patches of color drifted by, its vivid scarlet like a jewel spiraling lazily upward. Varta's eyes followed its drift, and so were guided to what she had forgotten, the worlds of Asti. Asti! Lur was looking up, too. The power of Asti! Varta's hand went up, rested for a long moment under the sun, and then drew it down, carefully, slowly as she had in Memphir's temple. Then she stepped towards the captive. Within her hood a beaded line of moisture outlined her lips. A pulse thundered on her temple. This was a fearsome thing to try. She held the sun on a line with one of the wrist bonds. She must avoid the flesh it imprisoned, for Asti's power could kill. From the sun there shot an orange-red beam to strike full upon the metal. A thin line of red crept across the smooth hoop, crept and widened. Varta raised her hand, sending the sun spinning up, and Lur's claws pulled on the metal. It broke like rotten wood in his grasp. The girl gave a little gasp of half-terrified delight. Then the old legends were true. As Asti's priestess, she controlled powers too great to guess. Swiftly she loosed the other hoops, and restored the sun and worlds to their place over her head as the captive slumped across the threshold of his cell. Tugging and straining, they brought him out of the broken ship into the sunlight of Herb. Varta threw back her hood, and breathed deeply of the air which was not manufactured by the wizardry of the lizard skin, and Lur sat panting, his nostril flaps open. It was he who spied the spring on the mountainside above, a spring of water uncontaminated by the strange life of the lake. They both dragged themselves there to drink deeply. Varta returned to the lake shore reluctantly. Within her heart she believed that the man that they had brought from the ship was truly dead. Lur might hold out the promise of the flowers, but this was a man and he had lain in the water for countless ages. So she went with lagging steps to find Lur busy. He had solved the mystery of the spacesuit and had stripped it from the unknown. Now his clawed paw rested lightly on the bared chest, and he turned to Varta eagerly. There is life! Hardly daring to believe that, she dropped down beside Lur and touched their prize. Lur was right. The flesh was warm, and she had caught the faint rhythm of shallow breath. Half remembering old tales, she put her hands on the arch of the lower ribs, and began to aid that rhythm. The breaths were deeper. Then the man half turned. His arm moved. Varta and Lur drew back. For the first time the girl probed gently the sleeping mind before her even as she had read the minds of those few of Memphir who had ascended to the temple precincts in the last days. Much of what she read now was confused, or so alien to Herb that it had no meaning for her. But she saw a great city, plunged into flaming death in an instant, and felt the horror and remorse of the man at her feet because of his own part in that act, 
the horror and remorse which had led him to open rebellion and so to his imprisonment. There was a last dark and frightening memory of a door closing on light and hope. The spaceman moaned softly, and hunched his shoulders as if he struggled vainly to tear loose from bonds. "'He thinks that he is still prisoner,' observed Lur. "'For him life begins at the very point it ended, even as it did for the turby flowers. See, now he awakens.' The eyelids rose slowly, as if the man hated to see what he must look upon. Then, as he sighted Varta and Lur, his eyes went wide. He pulled himself up and looked dazedly around, striking out wildly with his fists. Catching sight of the clumsy suit Lur had taken from him, he pulled at it, looking at the two before him as if he feared some attack. Varta turned to Lur for help. She might read minds and use the wordless speech of Lur, but his people knew of the art of such communication long before the first priest of Asti had stumbled upon their secret. Let Lur now quiet this outlander. Delicately, Lur sought a way into the other's mind, twisting down paths of thought strange to him. Even Varta could not follow the subtle waves sent forth in the quick examination and reconnoitering, nor could she understand all of the conversation which resulted. For the man from the ancient ship answered in speech aloud, sharp, harsh sounds of no meaning. It was only after repeated instruction from Lur that he began to frame his messages in his mind, clumsily and disconnectedly. Pictures of another world, another solar system, began to grow more clear as the spaceman became more at home in the new way of communication. He was one of a race who had come to Herb from beyond the stars, and discovered it a world without human life. So they had established colonies and built great cities, far different from Memphir, and had lived in peace for centuries of their own time. Then, on the faraway planet of their birth, there had begun a great war, a war which brought flaming death to all that world. The survivors of a last battle in outer space had fled to the colonies on Herb, but among this handful were men driven mad by the death of their world, and these had blasted the cities of Herb, saying that their kind must be wiped out. The man they had rescued had turned against one such maddened leader, and had been imprisoned just before an attack upon the largest of the colony's cities. After that he remembered nothing. Varta stopped trying to follow the conversation. Lur was only explaining now how they had found the spaceman and brought him out of the wrecked ship. No human on Herb, this one had said, and yet were there not her own people, the ones who had built Memphir? And what of the barbarians, who, ruthless and cruel as they seemed by the standards of Memphir, were indeed men? Whence had they come, then, the men of Memphir and the ancestors of the barbarian hordes? Her hands touched the scaled skin of the suit she still wore, and then rubbed across her own smooth flesh. Could one have come from the other? Was she of the blood and heritage of Lur? Not so, Lur's mind, as quick as his flickering tongue, had caught that panic-born thought. You are of the blood of this space-wanderer. Men from the river colonies must have escaped to safety. Look at this man. Is he not like the men of Memphir, as they were in the olden days of the city's greatness? The stranger was tall, taller than the men of Memphir, and there was a certain hardness about him which those city-dwellers in ease had never displayed. But Lur must be right. This was a man of her race. She smiled in sudden relief, and he answered that smile. Lur's soft laughter rang in both their heads. Asti, in his infinite wisdom, can see through centuries. Memphir has fallen because of its softness, and the evil-doing of its people, 
and the barbarians will now have their way with the lands of the north. But to me it appears that Asti is not yet done with the pattern he was weaving there. To each of you he granted a second life. Do not disdain the gifts of Asti, daughter of Herb. Again Varta felt the warm tide of blood rise in her cheeks. But she no longer smiled. Instead, she regarded the outlander speculatively. Not even a maiden of the temple could withstand the commands of the All-Highest. Gifts from the hand of Asti dared not be thrown away. Above the puzzlement of the stranger she heard the chuckling of Lur. The End of The Gifts of Asti by Andre Norton This recording is in the public domain.